to rest and abide. That, that's something you really need to know and understand in this generation. You're coming up on that time period when you're going to hear of great depressions, uh, wars, rumors of wars, all these things need to be before the end comes. But when they cry peace, 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 total peace, you want to watch out. But are you immune? There is an inoculation that you can receive from the comforter. And that is simply to know the truth that enables you to rest in him, to abide in him, and do you know something? He promises he'll look out for you. I mean, there may still be some rocks in the road, but you know something? You're a man or a woman or a child of God, and you can cut it. When it's too rough for everybody else, it's just right for you. You can handle it. That's why God chose you, to hear truth and to know and to understand. We're going to pick it up in the 11th chapter of the great book of um, Matthew. Jesus has just been confronted by the apostles of John, the Baptist, that is to say. And many miracles had been performed, and the, some of the people from these cities, they just still didn't believe after they had seen the miracles. So he picks up in verse 25, uh, concerning this, he, he even told them, he said, you know something? He said, uh, Chorazon and Bethsaida, if the miracles that have been performed in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they'd have believed. They would have. Look at Nineveh. Nineveh believed when they saw Jonah from the whale. Uh, they, and they were not of Israel. They were not, we'll say, Christians. And certainly they became believers. But these people were stubborn. And therefore Christ comes forth with this message. Verse, chapter 11, verse 25, and it reads, uh, And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, he's talking to our Father, Lord of heaven and earth, all inclusive, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Properly translated, what it means is, you, it would seem that the wise and the prudent can't quite get this, but you have put it forth in such a simplistic way that a child can understand it if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so it is. That's what truth is always like. True wisdom is to take that that's complicated for the wise and prudent, and put it in a language that anyone can, a child can understand. That's how God's word is. Uh, and, and Jesus was thanking our Father for that miracle that when put forth simply, people can hear and people can understand. Verse 26, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Our Heavenly Father liked that. He liked the simplicity in which Christ delivered. 27, all things are delivered unto me from my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Whoever can see, have eyes to see the simplicity of the truth as he brings it forth. Whoever can hear with their ear the simplicity of the saving power and love of Almighty God as he intercedes, as he comes to you, as, as he touches you. That's our Father's love for you. Verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a promise. I don't know. Have you ever claimed it? All you that labor, that are under a heavy burden, come to me. He says, talk to me about it. When you talk to me about it, I'm going to see to it that you find that rest, that you rest from it, and that God leads you and protects you, and you'll be just fine, okay? Uh, so what do you do? You come to him. 
How do you do that? Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That, that goes deeper than flesh. That means to your eternal soul, you will find that rest. You know what that is? That's peace of mind. Peace of mind in this age and this time is a rarity. Not too many people possess it because of the confusion that Satan brings into the world through Babel and confusion where it's difficult if you can't filter out through the Holy Spirit what is right and what is the simple way of God saying, hey, if you'll come to the Son, you see, there's no other way. If you'll come to the Son, the Father will take care of you. That's where you will find that rest, that peace of mind. And he will see to it. You see, he sent a comforter. When Christ left us, he did not leave us nor forsake us. He sent the comforter, which is God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that spirit loves you and cares for you if you love him. That's how you come to him is by admitting that love, seeking it, and asking his protection and his help in whatever you do. And uh, simple, you bet it is, but it's real. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality, it's real life. Uh, let's talk about the yoke a minute, you know. The yoke is, is, um, is a place whereby you place the hames or the tugs, and if you just put a tug around the neck of the animal, it would cut in. It would be brutal. You would have sores on that animal. Many of us are old enough that we worked horses. And it was even collar, when you use hanes and collars, sometime in, in a real hard work time, the sores will develop even under the collar. But without the collar, it would cut to the bone. So what Christ is saying put on my yoke and that load your dragon, be nothing to it. You can cut it, but you've got to put on his yoke, which is his love. He's, he's meek, meaning he's humble. He's easy to approach. All you have to do is let him know you love him and hook those tugs or your, the, the, um, to the yoke itself, which is Christ. And he says, I'll take care of a lot of that load for you. You see, a lot of that is worry. Some people just love to worry. You just give me some, anything to worry about. Why? You know, why? Why would you want to when you have promises like this? Saying, put on my yoke and lighten the load. That's just like saying, put, in other words, you're still going to accomplish the same thing. You know why? He's going to help you. It's his yoke. And that's what the Holy Spirit is about. Christ uses terminology that is so simple, such as a yoke and a tug, and the working of an animal. Agriculture has a little advantage when it comes to understanding the word, I think. Because it makes, it makes that load easier for you, whereby you can cut it, you know. He didn't say he was going to take care of the, all of that load for you. He's just going to make it a lot easier for you. Because he wants somebody that can get it done. All right, That's what true Christians are about. So therefore, that's why you put on his yoke. And that rest will come to you because the load lightens to the point. It's manageable. You can cut it. You can handle it. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His yoke is easy to put on. Do you ever talk to him? That, that's, you know, he listens to you. He loves you and he wants to hear from you. Do you know what God wants from you through that spirit? Is your love. And when you let him know you love him, he'll knock a lot of those rocks out of the road for you. Otherwise, if you enjoy stumbling around in the dark with Satan, go ahead. Hey, it's, it's, your, it's your prerogative. It's your way. Now, there was a time that people were 
so busy doing God's work, they needed a break. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. How is it when people that are doing church work, that are following God, how is it that um, they get this rest? Does Christ realize how tired, tiring uh, work can be, especially in a ministry that is just boom, boom, boom. People need that ministering. They need that work. They need that help. They need that information. And it can be, it can get to be a long day sometimes. Well, how do you handle that? Christ's teachings, Mark 6, verse 31. And this is Christ. He's, I mean, things have really been popping, and Christ says to them, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place, and rest a while. In other words, pull away from this crowd. Let's go out to a desert place where we can have some privacy, and you can rest. This is kind of an um, object lesson in what's most important. Okay. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. That was fantastic. God's work was being done. And, and they were really putting the word out. Uh, verse 32. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. They slipped away in a little boat. 33. And the people saw them departing. How hungry they were. And many knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities and outwent them, outran them, figured it out, and came together into him, starving, craving truth, craving that rest, craving that leadership. They could hardly contain themselves, that they were willing to drop everything. They gave them no rest. Okay. They ran around the shoreline until they caught where they were going to disembark. And 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, there was a crowd, and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. No rest, but that in itself is rest. In trusting him, loving him, and knowing him. That the sheep need that shepherd. He is that shepherd. Our Heavenly Father, through that Son, is that shepherd that continues to feed, to take you to good pasture. That means good knowledge, good wisdom, good advice. And you know the main thing? There's nothing pleases Him more than to be able to bless you, to help you, to touch you. And here, even though they were tired, exhausted, trying to find a little solence where they could even have a square meal. And here they were begging for truth, for the simplicity of God's word. Listen, we're in a time like that now. People are hungry. They are starving to hear the real word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse taught, grows like wildfire. People wanting to hear. And that's why when, you know, when God blesses the word, his word, you can't go wrong. Why? He's going to bless you too. So, regardless of how tired you may be in witnessing or experiencing or just sharing with someone a word of wisdom, a word of truth, in the simplicity don't ever be one of these complicated, muddy-the-water, muckety-ducks, okay? But you don't understand, brother, I have a deeper truth. No, you, you've, got, you've got a bunch of nonsense. That's what you've got. Christ didn't teach uh, a bunch of muckety-ducks. He taught in simplicity that a child can understand, in clarity. And he never refused them, though they had gone there. Here came the crowd, hungry, starving. What did he do? 
He fed them, told them many things. 35, and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place and now the time is far past. They, they don't hardly have time to go to town and get something to eat. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. And naturally, you know the story from there. Christ said, well, wait a minute. Feed them. Feed them what? The famine in these end times is not for bread. It's not for two little fishes. Famine in these end times, as it's written in the book of Amos, is for hearing the word of God, for hearing the real truth, the guidance, the simplicity that brings God's blessings when you take on the yoke that takes care of the hard stuff whereby you can handle the rest. Then all you have to do is ask him. Talk to him. That's how you find rest in him. Now, to fully find that rest, you must abide in him. Turn with me to the great book of John, chapter 14. John chapter 14, and we're going to talk about actually being with him. Being with him, though he sits at the right hand of God, as your advocate, as your attorney, not between you and God, but between you and your troubles in this world putting on that yoke and taking care of those troubles, making them a little easier for you. That's called blessings from God when you talk to him. Let's take this 14th chapter. Let's pick it up with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Will you please stop worrying? That's what it means. Will you please stop worrying? You believe in God. Believe also in me. That's, that's what it takes. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go. This word mansions is moni. It means a resting place. This is how you find that rest. It's not some big castle out in the never-never land. All right? It's a resting place, a place that you can find peace of mind. A place, and I would advise everyone, if you've never checked it out in the Greek, take your Strong's Concordance and do it so you know you're not talking about pie in the sky. Because this is for now. This is for those that wish to enjoy it now. That is to find the resting place, to abide in him and stop your worrying. Verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It's a guarantee, promise. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, what is this Holy Spirit? It's him. It's the Spirit of God. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Some people have difficulty grasping that, but God saw fit when they wouldn't listen to him talk on the mountain, frightened them. Then he came of a born of woman. The living word became flesh and walked among us, simplifying it where you could communicate, where you could hear, where you could enjoy that presence. And that Holy Spirit does come. It touches your heart. It lifts you up. Do you know why they call him the comforter? Because he comforts you. You don't have time to worry with that comfort totally absorbed in your heart, mind, body, and soul. How precious it is. Uh, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. In other words, you learned in the book of Ecclesiastes where I'm going. You learned in Psalms 22 where I'm going. You learned in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, who I am, a virgin shall conceive, will have a, a, a man-child, and you will call him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. That's where your answer is. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. 
old doubting, old doubting Thomas is good for us because a lot of people doubt. Okay, let's see what he's got to say. Verse 5, Thomas said unto the Lord, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? I mean, here he's walked with them all the time, and he didn't realize that Christ is the only way. You have to do it Christ's way. He's the path you have to take. He's the living word. But Thomas, he's a little caught off guard, and you can be the same if you're not real careful. Six, Jesus said in him, I am the way. And I am is part of the sacred name. Okay. I am that I am. The, I am the way, the truth, the life, that's eternal life. No man, I'll repeat that, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's all inclusive. That upsets some people. Sorry, that's the way it is. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Well, well, let's see him. Let's, let's show him to us. They were looking at him. Emmanuel, God with us. That simple for some, and some can't see it. Just cannot understand. And how clear and how simple it is. Uh, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it suffice us. We'll be happy. Nine, Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You see, it was so written by the prophet Isaiah. His name was Emmanuel. And it's even interpreted for you from the Hebrew. God with us. In other words, God, God saw fit that he loved you enough. Because people would say, well, God can do anything. I mean, after all, he doesn't live in these flesh bodies where they suffer from the heat and the cold and what have you. He, he's God. Well, he came down and showed us how to do it right. In the flesh, in the heat, in the cold, in the danger. And told us how to do it without a bunch of whimpering, like a bunch of wimps in distress and let his power and his name come forth in the simplicity of one that has ears to hear and eyes to see, to know when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. For he was Emmanuel, and he was with us. Um, and verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth, this is that word mono, dwell is just like that word mansion, it means abide, be there. In me, he doeth the works, it's mino, okay. to dwell in Christ. Do you know what that feels like? It's a really good feeling. It's to touch the Holy Spirit and to know that Holy Spirit, to feel him. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In other words, if you can't believe my word, look at the miracles. You know, people raised from the dead, and the blind seen, and those miracles performed to give credentials to unbelievers this is Messiah. This is God with us. And so it is with uh, that wonderful word of God that he promised that spirit that would come to us as he's just about to do here. And um, verse, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. How possibly could some disciple of Christ do greater works than he did? Well, you know something? They traveled by foot, by burrow. They traveled by boat. 
sailboats, not motorboats. Do you understand what we have today that are miracles? If you somebody from that time looked, here at this location we can push one button and go all the way around the world in nanoseconds and reach millions of people right in their homes. But do you know who does it? He promised it. Said it's going to happen. Greater things than those large crowds, greater things than feeding even, would take place in a larger feeding. The feeding of the word of God. And no man can take credit for that. No person can take credit for that. He said it. He acted upon it. He did it. He will use whomever he chooses, and we are all equal within that, that labor. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he, we got that, okay, verse 13, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is, a lot of people say, well, boy, I can just ask for whatever. What's he talking about? The ministry. In other words, if you have a ministry and you want to, to, you need some bricks to build a building, he'll give you the bricks, but you've got to do the work. You've got to do the building. But ask for it. Now, you're looking at living proof right here. That's the way it is. He'll give you whatever you'll use to further his word, not yours, his word. You won't have to beg to get it done. He sees to it. Why? That's his word. And he's real. He's true. And, and so it is. Verse 50, if you love me, keep my commandments. How could you help it? If you love him, you're going to keep this word. Why? Because that's where your blessings come from. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. There's that word abide. Abide again. Me no. Resting place. Abiding with him. Finding that peace. There is no other. And how long was that for? Forever. You don't have to wait till heaven to receive that comforter. You don't have to wait till heaven to find that rest. It's here now. Just love him. Talk to him. And enjoy 17, even the spirit of truth. Well, what, what spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's spirit. It's the spirit of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth, there's that word again, dwelleth, abideth, with you and shall be in you. If you partake of him, the simplicity of simplicity of a child to believe and to receive that power from on high to be used of him for him and with him why he loves you have you ever wondered why well, wonder why he created me well your dna is different than anybody else's your fingerprints are different you're unique there's nobody else like you he created you exactly the way he wanted you. He may not like what you're doing, but he does love you. So let it return that love and do it his way. 18, I will not, I repeat, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's now. Do you need that comfort? I just want to worry a little bit. You know, I've got a lot of things I need to worry about. Oh, you poor, miserable soul. You know, you've got him. Why would you do that? What, what, what's wrong with you? I just feel better if I could worry. Oh, my poor thing. You know, I, I'd like to counsel you privately for about 10 minutes, and I guarantee you, you'd have a different attitude, okay? That's the way it goes. He will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Why, he's here. The Spirit, the Comforter. 
because I live, you shall live also. That's eternal. It's forever, dear one. All that day, you, at that day, you shall know what that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Skip to verse 23. Jesus answered and said, If any man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we, plural, we will come in unto him and make our abode with him. There's that abode. There's that forever with you. That's how you find love. That's how you find rest. And that's how he abides with you. Do you know the proof of Christ's teachings? How simple it is? You see, everything we read there, he says in about eight verses in the next chapter, I mean, taking away all necessarily that is spiritual and putting it in a labor person's language, but it says the same thing. In conclusion of this lecture, let's read it, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. This is an action. You know what a vine, a, vi a vineyard is? It grows grapes, okay? And do you know who the husbandman is? He's the one that takes care of the plants. To every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He crops it off. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. He prunes it a little bit. That it may bring forth more fruit. Anybody that tends a vineyard knows you've got to get that dead wood out of there and trim it up and purge it and prune it, and it really produces. Do you think not that he does for you? You're that branch. And sometimes he may have to, to clean your act up a little bit, a little clip in here and a little clip in there whereby you can produce more fruit because you're happy in him through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, now ye are clean, or you are pruned, through the word which I have spoken unto you. This brings it right down where a child can understand. Your pruning comes from the word itself. That's why you want to rightly divide it and absorb it, whereby the word gets your act together. Because that brings the blessings of God. We're not just playing church here. This is a reality. That's what true Christianity is about. Up verse 4, here comes that word again, abide in me. It's mono. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you ex except you abide in me. That's the only way you can produce fruit is to have him is to be in his spirit, to have that spirit in you, touching you, and you enjoying his word, and he leading your life. I am the vine, and you are the branches, he that abideth in me. You that are hooked to me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You know, a lot of people, if they could just see that, it would change their lives. Without me, you can do nothing. And you know what? There's a bunch of do-nothings in this world. I mean scads of do-nothings. Because they don't have him. And that's what the blessing comes for those that simply say, Father, I love you. Use me. Don't know much, but I'm willing to learn. Handle it. He will. Talk to him. Communicate. If a man abide, there's our word, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Many of you, in any time there's pruning, you know what happens to an old branch that gets clipped off? It dies. It's good for nothing. So when God tries to do a little pruning on you, you say, you kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Father, I, I, I got it. I see. 
and follow him. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, don't overread that. My words abide in you. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You can count on it. Okay. That's in the ministry, in your ministry, in your gift. Everyone has a gift of some kind that makes up part of the many-membered body. And if you don't know what it is, ask him to show you. He will. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide, there it is again, in my love, even as I, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's a family. It's the Christian family. We're almost through. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Do you know that he did that? He was crucified on that cross written a thousand years before the fact. And he did it for you because you're not perfect and he knew you needed that repentance and forgiveness. You are my friends. Do you understand that's Christ talking to you? If you do whatsoever I command you, henceforth I call you not servants. Get this family tie here, the vine and the branch. I don't call you servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me. We come down to the election here. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You want to bring forth fruit? Find your gift and use it. I guarantee you that fruit will come forth and there will be less pruning in your life than you ever could have imagined. Rest in him, that brings peace of mind. It's so valuable in this generation. Be wise enough that you understand the word of God and can see Satan's plan for he's wiggling and he's using it. He's frightening people. But God has told you, I give you power over him. Use it. Use it in your family. Don't put up with nonsense. Discipline in the word of God. God will be with you. He will give you that rest. And he will abide in your very heart, mind, soul. He will abide in your family. So don't be one of these, well, I just hate to give up on that. I just need to worry again. Don't give me that. It won't fly. Because our Father is not a doubter. He's a provider. He provides love, direction, guidance. Most of all, he loves you and he provides blessings in your family. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the comforter. Thank you, Father, for the comfort today that we don't have to wait. He's here. We appreciate it so much, Father. May the word go forth, Father, throughout the world that brings peace of mind and a place of abode to those that are homeless uh, uh, spiritually and need that direction. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. 
Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. If you can identify someone with an identifier, if it's true, but to call somebody a name for the sake of calling a name is not right. You show me a real woman of God, and I'll tell you one that nobody's going to call names, or she will be right in their face. She will take names, and she will kick dragon. You see, women of God don't put up with nonsense. And that's, I don't know who has brainwashed you into thinking you have to take all that stuff. Because if you've ever read Luke chapter 10 following verse 19, God gives you power over Satan himself in the name of Jesus Christ. What do you do about it? Action. Do something about it. You don't have to take malarkey off of anybody. Christians are not second-class citizens. We don't give ground. We take ground. Many, you know, I have a work somewhere, Women of the Bible. I think it would help you if you ordered that. You see, there's been some great women. You, do you understand that way back um, in olden times that Hulda was a woman that was over the university of God? She taught the priest. And have you never heard of Deborah? The judge Deborah. She was, there wasn't a man strong enough to lead Israel. And Deborah went out, she got in a chariot and she led Israel in war and won. So, being a child of God makes the difference. Um, children of God, male or female, take nothing off nobody. And yet are gentle all at the same time if it's possible. But Father didn't raise a bunch of wimps. And Father can hardly use a bunch of wimps. He chooses men, women, and children of the living God. Deanna from, Deanie rather from Louisiana, I'm a female in this earth age, will I be male or female for all eternity? I would really like to take this question off the shelf. Thank for your uh, devotion, dedication, and service to God and your viewers. Well, you are so welcome and it's always a pleasure. Jesus answered this question when one, some people were trying to trip Christ up and they said, this little girl was married to seven men. They all died. Which one of them is she going to be with in heaven? He said, you err because they're, you're neither, neither given nor taken in marriage because you're all as the angels. We've got far more things other than flesh bodies in the eternity. So when it says you are as the angel, why? You are an angel. That meaning you're in a spiritual body. And um, <clears throat> God never takes anything away. He doesn't give us something much better. Clarence, um, I'm going to say uh, Clarence. I think that's what that is, California. For Greek and Hebrew manuscripts along with the language in the book of Genesis, is it possible to calculate creation date of the second earth age and date of Noah's flood? If so, please explain. Um, clearance, and I can read it there. <clears throat> well, it's really, it's pretty easy. There were 4,000 years up to Christ from creation of this particular dispensation of time. And then naturally, we know what, what it is after Christ. When you say A.D., you're saying Anno Domini, which is to say the year of our Lord. 2010. So add to 2010, 4,000, and you've got 6,000, 
and we're working on 10 years here. Now, dispensations of time, one day with God is as a thousand years with man. That's kind of the sixth day getting ready for the seventh to begin, and even the seventh and ready for the eighth if you take the first earth age as a day. And nobody knows how long it was. It was millions of years. But this dispensation is pretty easy to, to figure. Nellie from Texas. I've been watching your Bible teaching for about 12 years now, and I love it, and I'm learning all about God from you and your son, Dennis. Well, while I am asking about making a vow to these preachers, they ask for money on they... Uh, then they take your tithes and offerings on one preacher sends a book and said it was for the harvest plan and asked for money and tithes and offerings. Tithes go to where you're taught. Okay. You've got a lot of people that are money raisers. That's why you won't ever hear a telethon on SCN. You won't ever hear me begging for money. Why? Because Christ didn't send out beggars. Anyone that begs for money is a fake. Okay, They're, If God wants them to be on in a ministry, he will supply the means. He will see that people do if they have the real word. A true person of God does not have to beg nor ask for money. And anyone that does, I would not waste my tithes on them. Uh, this is why you won't find us on too many religious networks buying time because they won't allow us because of the things I just stated. Okay. But I'm very much against it. If, if I ever buy time and somebody puts a telethon on and pretends that I'm a part of it, I'm gone. I'm out of there. I don't beg and I don't think any true person of God should. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to the apostles when he sent them out, do not take a begging bag. If you can read the Greek, you got it. So and you, you simply, in Christ, tithe where you're taught, period. Margaret from West Virginia. Um, also, don't let somebody say, well, you made a vow to, uh, you made a vow to God. And if they're begging, they're not from God, so you don't owe the vow to them. Got it? You owe the vow where you're taught God's word, period. Um, Margaret from West Virginia. I, the reason I'm saying that, many people on fixed incomes do not have, they're not, they barely have enough to, for medicine and homes and food. And then somebody puts them on guilt trips of trying to raise, beat them out of money. It's a shame and a disgrace. Margaret from West Virginia. If a man and woman divorced, then after three weeks get back together, should they remarry or just reconcile? I've asked other preachers, all they tell me is that the Bible says to reconcile. I've read the Bible and that is about all it says is to be reconciled. Well, you, you want to take into consideration, are there children in this family or are you in childbearing age? Because um, the... And, and what about property? If you divorced and there was a settlement and some, a property was placed in this person's name or the other, if something should happen again, what you make, you're not married legally. And I'm speaking legally now, spirit, not spiritually. But you have to take that into consideration because uh, in a sense, the two are not one if um, their names are bo not both on all the properties. And you, it, you could get hurt real bad that way. So something you need to take into consideration in the equation. William from Georgia. As Christians, when the one world system happens, can we spend the money? I am disabled and partaking in the money mean that I am worshiping the Antichrist. No. It'll be, when the Antichrist comes, it'll be a totally different, it'll be a one world system and it'll have a one world money. To receive any of it, you would have to worship the Antichrist. God takes care of his own with what you have. You won't have any fears or worries about it. Don't worship Satan for any reason. 
God will take care of you. Mary from Missouri. Uh, Pastor Murray, as you can see by our return address, or um, okay, our address is four two. I'm not going to. I'm a bunch of sixes. I'm going to say that so I don't give your address. President Ronald Reagan, when retiring in California, refused these numbers. My husband thinks I'm a foolish about the matter. My mother's address, and you give another address on the same. Why can't we use that? Don't. It, it isn't what's numbered is what's up here in your mind. You receive the mark of the beast between your ears and your forehead. That's your brain. Uh, the number on a box or anywhere else is ha absolutely means nothing. They could tattoo you from head to foot with 666. It wouldn't change your love for Christ. And that's what you're judged by. So that should tell you something. Number, it's what's in your mind, what, meaning <clears throat> whether or not you worship the false Christ or you stay true to the truth. Numbers have nothing to do with that. The only reason Satan is given 666 is because he comes at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. That's the 666 that's important. Uh, Lucy from New Jersey. I heard you say Adam is not Cain's father. Please explain Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Well, um, does it not say in chapter 3 I will that um, Eve had already conceived and that God would put enmity between her, the woman's seed and Satan's seed? Did you not read that? And then in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Adam knew Eve and she conceived. And she said, if, if, Yahweh, with the help of God, I've got a child. And then in verse 2, very important, it says, and again, only the word in the Hebrew is she continued in labor and gave birth to another child. In other words, they were twins, but they were not identical twins. This is why when you read chapter 4, you have Cain's genealogy, and when you read chapter 5, you have Adam's genealogy, and you will not read Cain's name in Adam's genealogy, and the obvious is he wasn't his son. <clears throat> so it's being able to read the manuscripts is where you see the difference there, okay? Uh, Lorraine from Pennsylvania. I have a question, Luke 16. Are the people on the wrong side of the gulf being tormented constantly? Not unless they do it to themselves. <clears throat> In other words, if the rich man was tormented because he thought he knew everything, and he found out he knew nothing because he didn't know the Lord. He tormented himself because he had missed the mark. <clears throat> he had to be pretty sharp because he was rich. And he knew how to get rich with ill-gotten gains and what have you. But he knew enough to say, send Lazarus back to my brothers, because if they see a man raised from the dead, then they'll believe and know for sure you're God. Well, Christ was raised from the dead, and they didn't believe him, and God knew that. That's why God used it there. But you see, once they're in paradise, they know there is the millennium coming. And if they had no opportunity and were deprived of knowing truth, they're going to be taught the truth in the millennium. Many might say, well, are you teaching a second chance? That's not a second chance. They didn't, with what's taught in this world today, they didn't have a prayer of a chance. They were misled, misguided. So God is always fair and he's kind. And he sees that um, in spiritual bodies, they have an opportunity to see Satan for who he is and what he is. And then we go from that, okay? Albert from Illinois. I would like you to answer for me, please. I've been, it's been with me since my mother passed away, 2007. My question, at the funeral home of the church member, a member at the cemetery let a dove in loose in the air. Question is that 
is that the same as the flyaway doctrine? I have been with this congregation since I was born, and I'm 49 years old. Please reply. You know, it is a tradition of the church. The dove is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And if that is their custom, that has nothing to do with the flyaway doctrine. Your mother, bless her heart, is already with the Father anyway. For as it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, instantly the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, the soul returns to the Father that gave it. And she's with him. So the dove is really insignificant. They did it in love, I have no doubt, because of the fact that the... Remember at Christ's baptism, the, the dove is always present with the Holy Spirit and then voice, the voice of God at that time with the presence of the dove said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So <clears throat> I would... You don't have anything to worry about. And it is apparently a tradition of the church. I see nothing wrong with it. Uh, Gordon from Florida. My question is, all the floods, droughts, earthquakes, is this the signs of the times? And is this part of the Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21? Well, it's leading up to it. Yep. What do you expect now until the one world government comes? Well, you have to have the appearance of the one world system and... Then, of course, when it receives the deadly wound. In other words, when you hear the opposite of wars and rumors of wars like Afghan, Iraq, and Iran, and so forth, and you begin to hear the whole world come together in one organization, and then it receives the deadly wound, then you're very close. You are in that generation now, and I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it, makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. He loves you for that. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, in your life, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.